30 years ago today, parts of Los Angeles erupted in unrest after a jury acquitted four white Los Angeles police officers over the videotape beating of Rodney King, a black motorist. On this anniversary, Stephanie Sai revisits the fallout from the Rodney King beating and examines what has and has not changed. For many longtime Angelinos, the sights and smells of April 29, 1992 are still easily conjured. Smoke spread across L.A. as buildings were set on fire. Images of looting filled television screens. And less visible, the hurt expressed through peaceful protest. You hear the verdicts and you hear the one not guilty after another. I was angry. There's no other way for me to say it. I was just furious at, at the justice system. When people had expected some type of justice when it didn't happen, it was like another blow. It was like, you know, black lives don't really matter. I picked up the phone and I told my staff, go get your kids, go home, don't leave your houses. The city is going to blow. South Los Angeles, where much of the unrest unfolded, had been home to the city's largest black population for decades. Rhonda Mitchell's family, like many, had settled in L.A.'s Crenshaw district after leaving the South during the Great Migration. It was just the place to be. Uh, Crenshaw was alive. It crackled. But in many parts of L.A., tensions between communities of color and the LAPD had been simmering since the last bout of unrest in 1965. Mitchell's father, who lived through the Watts uprising, worried history was repeating itself after the Rodney King verdict came down. During the riots, I called him and I asked him how he was doing. And he, he was weary. He was sad about what was going on in the neighborhood. There was a lot of pressure and a lot of kindling, and it just took one spark. Connie Rice was an attorney for the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund at the time. African Americans were furious at LAPD for the humiliation, for the gratuitously uh, cruel policing, for the constant harassment. No for nearly a week after the acquittals, long frustrated Angelinos took to the streets. Nearly 10,000 military troops were deployed to restore order. By the end, more than 50 people were dead. Police made over 10,000 arrests, and people had burned and vandalized $1 billion worth of property. I mean, it's like Martin Luther King said a long time ago, you know, um, these types of events are the, are the voice of the voiceless. Darnell Hunt is the Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA. In 1992, he was a graduate student and a budding social scientist observing and documenting the events. I had my camcorder and I was walking around town trying to get a sense of what was happening and how it compared to what I was seeing on television news. And I ran into this old man who just gestured me over and he pointed to a store over here and he said, see that? Um, that's my record store. And, you know, I would sacrifice that in order to um, make sure that, you know, our voices are heard. But some people would hear that and they would say, but these were, these were their businesses. This yeah, was their yeah. community. Well, obviously for him, he would lived his whole life as a black man. He'd experienced what injustice can be, and he was willing to make that sacrifice. Media coverage at the time focused on the looting, the burning, and the violence without much context for the socioeconomic disparities and police treatment of people of color in Los Angeles that had been fomenting resentment since the 1960s. On that front, progress has been mixed. Most news reporters didn't capture the nuance, says Hunt, who's written books about media and race. Overlooking the underlying causes, the structural causes that you know, like inequality, racism, uh, racial profiling, economic um, um, insecurity, lack of employment, disinvestment in inner cities, all the things that created stress that led to the explosion that was triggered by the Rodney King beating verdicts. Rhonda Mitchell was a 911 operator for the LAPD at the time and witnessed the chaos erupting through the emergency phone lines. We were not answering calls unless it was really about life and death. She had taken the job for the pay and security, but in the aftermath of the verdict, her loyalties were divided. It was a struggle to work for the police department and hear what went on and know when hear the derogatory remarks uh, about people of color. You would hear racist comments? Yeah. And, and that's where it gets a little muddled for me, because we want the police in our community. We want our community safe. We don't want drug dealers all over the place. But the police didn't know how to 
how to interact with us. The trust had already been lost there between us and the police. The problems at the LAPD were partly addressed with diversity recruitment. The force is now majority people of color. But police killings of black and brown Angelinos are still often in the headlines, and accountability is rare. 30 years later, Connie Rice is still trying to help reform the police. She partnered with the LAPD to help create the Community Safety Partnership with a holistic approach to working in neighborhoods where mistrust still runs deep. The transition has to be from search and destroy, mass incarceration, shock and awe policing, to wrap around safety, heal and build, guardian policing, gladiator to guardian. That's the culture change. But you can't have that change without all of the other sectors changing too. Civil rights lawyers, the residents, government agencies. We ask cops to do too much. Rice says she has found like-minded police chiefs with the same goals, but that the message hasn't trickled down to the rank and file. If you stick people in a hellhole and you send cops in to make sure that what's in that ghetto stays there, you're gonna get what we get, which is riots, rebellions, uprisings that are triggered by a bad shooting, a bad stop. Uh, we're, we're one more video away from that kind of explosion again. Really? You think it's still possible? I'm afraid it's going to devolve again to a level of frustration because there isn't enough change. The, the political momentum has slowed, the federal legislation stalled. So while you've seen uh, a huge change in the culture and the Black Lives Matter movement has, has gone global, but it hasn't touched the DNA of American policing. Have the underlying problems that existed 30 years ago in South Los Angeles been addressed? I mean, all the basic measures of economic well-being, you know, across the different racial and ethnic groups, there's been very, very little progress since 1992, and in some cases we've gone backwards. So 1992 really did change your perspective. Oh, 1992 changed everything for me. South LA can feel like a cocoon. As I went to the same shops, um, those shops didn't exist anymore after 1992. The world, they were burned down. They were burned down. The world wasn't like it used to be in 1992. It changed, it shifted. And I've kept that, that shift has stayed with me since that time. So that's why I wear this necklace. In Rhonda's old neighborhood in South LA, a new metro line is being built, the center of a multi-million dollar revitalization project that aims to bring opportunity while celebrating the legacy of Black LA, a legacy of creativity, strength, and continuing struggle. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Stephanie Sai in Los Angeles.